Hello and welcome to the Car Care Not channel and welcome to a video that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. This is the 2023 GR Corolla, a car that Toyota should be very proud of. In today's video, we're not going to look at how many cup holders this car has and how, what kind of infotainment system it does have. We're going to do a proper technical review from a mechanic. We're going to see why this car is special and why Toyota should be very proud of this car right after this. Let's start our technical review with the engine. This is the G16E GTS 1.6 three-cylinder 12-valve engine. Very interesting to hear the words 12-valve because there's not a lot of three-cylinder engines out there in the world. And for Toyota, at least in the US, this is a first. Usually people, when they hear a three-cylinder engine, they think of something like this. But in reality, this is more like this, very close to. This engine is all Toyota. I mean, you look at the construction of this engine and everything around it and all the wiring and the way things are designed, this is 100% Toyota. And actually, the development of this engine is pretty interesting because me as a mechanic looking at this, I see a lot of shared parts. And people will say that's a bad thing. That's a good thing, folks. Let's dive into some of the mechanical bits of this engine so you will get a better knowledge with this engine. So starting from the top, we have a plastic valve cover. Jury's out on that, but again, this is not a car for reliability. Just have, this has to be said. Plastic valve cover with a very, very interesting oil spray nozzle system inside of it, which is pretty cool. It has a little odd shape. Now we go to the cylinder head and that's where things are kind of on the unique side and a little bit on the old school side, if you ask me. So most modern Toyota engines will have a two piece cylinder head. Basically there's a cylinder head where the valves are and then there is another piece attaches to it where the cam sits, cam tower, cam cradle, whatever you want to call it. This one actually has a single piece cylinder head with hydraulic lifters, with roller rockers, very similar design to the A25. They're actually identical to the A25, if not the same. That is a very interesting design because they're basically the same parts. There's nothing unique or kind of special part. No, they're just normal Toyota parts. And then we go into this, the valves themselves. So the seats of the valves are laser clad and they have an interesting positioning. So they have that round tumble flow, Pretty interesting. This is very similar again to the A25A and the M20A, the, basically the dynamic force engines. They use that in this engine, not for really just efficiency, it is actually a better flow for performance. And then from the cylinder head, we move into the head gasket. And the best part here is, they, if you read the technical data, they will say this, this head gasket is a tri-layer head gasket, metal head gasket. So is every single Toyota, modern Toyota out there. Nothing really special about it. It works. It works very well. In the end of that story, head gasket is very really standard Toyota stuff. There is nothing out of this world about it. Then we move into the cylinder block. The block is this is where the surprise is. Now the rods are forged. Some Toyota engines do have forged rods, but most of them don't. This one does. But other than that, the cylinder walls, for example, or the liners, they're a spiny or spinny type. Basically exactly the same as your Camry, Corolla, basically every single engine there is. It's an aluminum, all aluminum block. The, the cylinder liners are cast into it. So basically they put the liners and they cast everything around it. So they're not serviceable, they're super thin. If they get damaged, block is, goes to the garbage and you get a new one. Very tough block and unless you have severe conditions going on, you're not really going to wear it down. These things last a very long time. So it's a very familiar design. Now the crankshaft is offset on this engine. And the other thing that is interesting is they have two oil pans, one upper, one lower. That's pretty standard. But what is interesting, and I actually like, this is a good idea. They have a balance shaft. This is a three cylinder engine. It just, it does need a balance shaft to balance it out. The balance shaft is gear to gear mesh. So it sits right underneath the crankshaft and is meshed with it. Very interesting design. Doesn't have a separate chain for it. Doesn't have, just sits right underneath the crank. 
basically it bolts on to the block. Some of the other Toyota models, like the balance shaft will bolt on to the second oil pan or the upper oil pan. This one, it actually bolts to the block directly. It makes it more compact. Now, there's something they did here that is super interesting to me as we move into more of the mechanical bits of this engine. So the front timing cover is actually a unique design. I initially thought it was similar to the A25, but looking at this, it's a unique design. So there is an area between the cylinder head and the block where the head gasket is that actually does not have anything around it. There's basically the front cover is two pieces, one at the top, one at the bottom, and that's it. And the chain goes kind of through that area between the, the cylinder head and the block. And there's an opening in the head gasket where the chain goes. Usually that design you'll see in German cars. They love to do that. Not for the same reasons they did here, but the reasons they did it here is for compactness and you will not have an infamous front timing cover leak, which makes the front timing cover extremely simple to service. This is a timing chain engine, has one timing chain, very simple, extremely simple actually, and this is what I love about it. Moving on to the VVTi system. This engine has dual VVTi, of course. They are both oil controlled. There's no clever eVVTi or whatnot. They're oil controlled, very, very simple. It the oil does not travel through the valve cover. There's two actuators on the outside on the top front cover, as you see here. There's two actuators that are electronically controlled. All they have is a little plunger that pushes on the oil control valve inside. Very simple. If you look at an A25A, the exhaust side, that's exactly how it is. If you look at a V6 from a Tacoma 3.5 to GRFKS, that's exactly the same design. Down to the gear, down to the oil control valve inside the gear, and then the actuator on the outside. Nothing exclusive that's gonna cost you a small fortune if it ever goes bad one day. That is pretty cool. Yeah, this is where Toyota-ness is everywhere here. Now let's talk about the fuel system in this engine, which is also a Toyota special. This engine has a D4S system, basically like your Highlander, like your Tacoma, like every single car out there with a D4S system. You basically have three port injectors and three direct injectors. There is times where port injectors are better for performance missions and everything, and there's times where direct injectors are better. In this, you have best of both worlds. You have the times where you can use direct injection for their efficiency and their direct spray. And then you have the time where you can use port for their advantages. And the biggest thing is you don't have carbon buildup. I did do a video investigating, did this system actually work? And it did. Here's that video if you wanna check it out. But this is very familiar stuff. You basically have two fuel pumps, one fuel pump in the fuel tank, that sends fuel to the front, then it splits into two. One of them goes to the regular injectors, the three port injectors, like your mid-2000s Toyota had. And then one of those splits goes to a high pressure fuel pump, which is driven by the camshaft, sits right on top of the valve cover. That pressurizes the fuel to 3000 PSI, up to 3000 PSI, and then that goes to the direct injectors. Very, very basic. If you go get the regular version of this Corolla with hubcaps, it'll have exactly that, which is pretty interesting that this high performance car has very similar systems like that. And then the cooling system is actually the biggest surprise of them all. I mean, we see cars these days are going to electric water pumps and valves and all kinds of complications. This one skipped all that all together. This probably has one of the most basic cooling systems there ever is. For a high performance car, it's actually very surprising. The cooling system in this is basically mechanical, for lack of a better word. Mechanical water pump, belt driven. Mechanical thermostat, no distribution valve, no nothing. There's coolant that goes to the radiator, coolant goes to the engine, coolant goes to the heater core inside, no valve in between, and coolant goes to the turbo. Talk about the turbo in a little bit, but it's a super, super basic cooling system. It's pretty interesting. Hey, if it works, why change it? That's what they did here works pretty good. Of course, this has an electric cooling fan, nothing, no hydro fan or none of that complication for high performance engines. Just it's sufficient and it works. Now, the other thing that it's the little stuff. Now, this is also not exclusive to this. Most of your grandpa's Avalon actually has that, but here they kind of took it to the next level. The air box. 
Did you know that your grandpa's Avalon has a system where if you're under hard acceleration, it starts to ch channel air from the front of the car into the intake? Yeah, this has the same thing at a little bit more exaggerated level. Now this does have a mass airflow, just standard Toyota stuff. Through the airbox, there's actually a little solenoid. You can see it right in the front. That solenoid is vacuum controlled. When you accelerate hard, it actually opens a passage that gets air from in front of the bumper. Pretty cool. And when you're driving normally, it quiets down because that actually makes the intake louder. So you kind of have better air intake when you're driving fast and then normal air intake. So it's quiet when you're driving normally, which contributes to how quiet this car is. We'll talk about that in a bit. Now, something else that is very interesting to me, and this is what gets car guys super excited. If you look at the air box, it not only says GR and Toyota Gazoo Racing, it has three stripes on it. This little stuff is what gets us all excited, isn't it? Three stripes for three cylinders. Let's talk about the PCV system. Usually turbocharged engines and high performance engines are problematic when it comes to PCV systems because they have so much pressure, they're under a lot of flow, there's a lot of heat, there's a lot of blow by, all kinds of stuff. So here's where Toyota kind of did this the basic way. And I have a feeling this might not cut it down the road. But it's just my hunch. PCV system on this is basically exactly the same as your grocery getting Camry. Nothing wrong with the Camry. It's not meant to do what this thing does. So the PCV system has an oil separator. It's a plastic oil separator, very small, very basic. It sits right underneath the intake manifold. And then the PCV valve sits just like the A25 and the M20. It sits right between the intake manifold and the cylinder head. There's no way to replace it without removing the intake manifold. Absolutely no work around it. And they, the reason they did that, and this is kind of interesting because every car has this problem. Why all of a sudden this is such a big problem? They say this prevents the PCV valve from freezing. So now it's in a very hot spot. It will always be warmed up and not never get frozen. Well, what about all the cars, basically almost every single car out there in the world that is not very new? which has the PCV valve just sitting on the valve cover. I don't know, that's what they did. That's what they decided to do. So yes, if you wanna replace the PCV valve on this, it's a job and a half. Just like your A25, just like the M20, and just like the G16e. Now, the turbocharger this is what everybody wants to talk about. Yes, this engine has a single turbocharger. Not really super big, but it is really pushed to the limit here. But there is some interesting stuff about it because the way they designed it, this is where I told you there's Toyota-ness here. Unlike the Tundra, where I feel like they didn't go the normal Toyota route, here they really did. There is old school and old school. Now this turbo is cool and cooled, like we talked about. Very simple, cool and goes in, cool and goes out. Nothing really special. Same thing with oil. Oil goes in, oil goes out, nothing special. Now, the turbo is, it has ball bearing bearings in it and all this fancy stuff. Of course, every single modern turbo is like that. It's nothing really unique about it. The only thing, in my opinion, that is unique is it is integrated into the exhaust manifold. So if you want to remove it, all you got to do is remove the exhaust manifold and it, the whole thing just comes off. There's no exhaust manifold and then the turbo attached to it. Makes service a little bit better. However, the location of it being in the back and being that even though this is a small engine, the engine is actually pushed toward the back and that is intentional to try to keep the engine as close to the back as possible, not really push it forward where it hangs over the, where the drive axle is. Makes service for this turbo extremely difficult. It is a very tight space, but that's what they did. I wish they went the Honda route where the turbo was in the front. That would have been really nice, but that's what they did. Now, something else about this turbo, the wastegate. So the wastegate is what controls how much this turbo spools. So exhaust basically spins the impeller of the turbo on one side, other impeller generates pressure, and that's how turbos work in three seconds. But how do you control that? You keep rubbing the engine while well, this exhaust keeps coming out at a faster velocity and then this turbo just overspins and blows up the engine. The wastegate is a little door that opens and lets some of that exhaust escape to control how fast that turbo is spinning. Very simple concept here. Very old school. You go back to the earliest turbo cars. That's exactly how it is and it's still the same. However, here things are exactly like they were when the turbos came out. It's vacuum controlled. 
So there's a little vacuum modulator. When you apply vacuum to it, it pulls a rod that opens the wastegate, all mechanical stuff. You stop the vacuum to it, it closes that gate. Simple as that, and that's exactly how it is. You have a little valve with vacuum lines. When the computer controls the, the little solenoid, it applies vacuum and actually pulse modulates it so it can control how much that gate is open. I mean, it cannot be more reliable than that. There's two hoses and a little solenoid that's super accessible. If you have any issues with it, that's all it is. And then the other part of this turbo that is very, very old school, and usually I don't like this, but in this, it just, feels proper. I suppose it was sufficient, so that's why they did it this way. They want to keep, keep things simple. Most modern turbo cars are moving towards air to liquid intercoolers. So basically, liquid cools the air charge that goes into the engine. Cooler the air, the denser the oxygen in it, the more good it is. So in this engine, they decided to go basically the 90s route. This has an intercooler that sits very proudly in the front, which in certain trims, like this very one, it actually says GR4. That is something that will make every single car guy just smile. Even though we know that this system is not as efficient as the liquid to air ones, but it's just, it's just better to have a giant intercooler in the front. So this massive grill that this thing have actually does something other than cool the radiator and the condenser. You have a massive intercooler in the front that is very nice. And it's more nice when it says GR4. So this is a very, very basic turbocharging system. I mean, this is as basic as they come. Very simple to service, very simple to operate. Yes, there's more hoses and stuff, but it's very basic. And that's a surprise. Now there's something else about this car. Because they were obsessed with the weight distribution of this car, and I don't blame them because they really did that well, they had to move the battery in the trunk. Of course, spare tire is gone, you have an inflate kit, but you don't expect that in a car like this. They moved the battery in the back for just put a little bit more weight in the back. And instead, they gave you a little terminal here in case you need to jump start the car. Back door is electronic, can't open if the battery is dead, but you can mechanically unlock the door, pop the hood open, and then you can jump it right here. And to wrap up the engine section of this video, let's talk about the exhaust. Now the exhaust for the most part is pretty standard, right up to the moment where you get to the back. Two catalytic converters, standard stuff, one next to the turbo, one cleanup cap, nothing really special. But then you get to the very back. This car has three exhaust tips, and the joke is one per cylinder. Why not? I guess uh, this is a trend. Now, it is a little boyish when you look at it. It just doesn't, it feels like too much, but it grows on you and that's the best part. But it actually, it's not just for show. There is a slight purpose to it. So the way the muffler is constructed, it's a big muffler, two pipes on the side, one in the middle. The one in the middle actually has a cutoff valve. So it's shut off when you're driving normally Exhaust is routed through the whole muffler to the side pipes and that's where it exits. When you accelerate hard and you want better flow, louder noise, it actually opens that valve and now air has a less straight path to, through the muffler, outside, and that's how this exhaust works. Unfortunately, you cannot control it with a button and this is where Toyota's conservativeness comes in. But hey, we're not complaining. This is a beautiful car and we really are in love with it. Let's talk about the all-wheel drive system, which is a pretty sophisticated system here. So this is called the GR4, and it is flat out a rally car all-wheel drive system in a production car. At first for Toyota, for modern Toyotas, in the past they've had a few cars that are like this, but this system is so sophisticated, but at the same time, so simple and basic. And it will shock you how basic it is. The basic premise of this system is it has three modes. One of the modes sends 70% of the power to the rear, 30% of the power to the front. The second mode sends 60% of the power to the front, 40% to the rear. And the third mode sends 50% to the front, 50% to the rear, and you can easily adjust it with a little toggle on the interior. Very, very simple. Now, here's how that actually works. This has a manual transmission, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. That manual transmission is connected to a transfer case. It is a mechanical transfer case. Basically, all it does, takes the motion that is going this way, sends it that way. 
That's all it does. There is no electronics, there's no fanciness, there's nothing. It's just a rugged piece of metal. Transfer case always spinning, sends power to the rear. Differential in the back, axles, wheels, axles in the front. But on the nose of the, of the differential in the back, there is an electromagnetic clutch. And that's really where all the magic happens. It's unlike a, say, a RAV4, which has a tiny little magnetic clutch. This has a massive magnetic clutch that has a multi-plate, very, very sophisticated. What that can do, it's not, there's no friction, it's electromagnetic. It's basically a magnet that does that, that does its thing. They vary how strong that magnet is. If it's stronger, you're at 70% to the rear because now you're engaging that rear differential more and then most of the power is going to the rear, very little in the front, which is the 70% in the rear, 30% in the front. When they want 60% in the front, 40% in the rear, the magnetic force decreases. So now you have kind of an air slippage, if you would, and now you have more power going to the front less power going to the rear. When you want 50-50, it just evens it out. It becomes the same thing as the front. Now you have 50% in the back, 50% in the front. In theory, that is a very, very simple operation. There is nothing really about it. So reliability of the system is gonna be very good, except when you keep jarring it, hard acceleration, hard acceleration, eventually one axle is going to give or something is going to happen. But as far as wear to that electromagnetic coupler in the back, there is nothing to wear. It's, elect it's electricity. It's, it's, for lack of a better word, it's magic. And I love it. There's something about this also. In the core model, they're open diffs. The front differential is open, rear differential is open, nothing about it. In the circuit edition, you have torsion limited slips in the front and the rear. Now the core package, you can, core package being like the base model, if you would, you can option it out to a torsion limited slip in the performance package. So that's pretty cool. So let's talk about the brakes of the GR Corolla. And things are anything but normal here. The front brakes are 14 inch rotors, 14 inch rotors. There was a time where the Corolla's wheels were 14 inches. Now the brakes on the GR Corolla are 14 inch rotors. The rotors are very interested. They have little slits for cooling and they are a two piece rotor in the front. Sounds like a very expensive rotor and it is. The caliper in the front is a four piston caliper. Again, never thought I'd see a day where a Corolla has a four piston caliper, but here we are. Something interesting about these calipers. So the bolts that bolt them to the knuckle, they're not from the back, like basically every single Toyota. They're kind of like some Lexus models. They're in the front. Very interesting design. I think it's a better design, very easy to service, and it works really well. Now the rear brakes, they're almost 12 inches big, which is still very big. There are very, some very big trucks with rotors that are smaller than the rear rotors on this little hot hat. The rear calipers are two piston calipers, and they are fixed same style bolt that goes in the front. And then the parking brake is actually mechanical in this. And it is the parking brake shoes in the rotor hat, standard stuff. And this is the interesting part because the normal Corolla in this generation has electronic parking brake. This does not, and that's intentional and that's good. Now the rotors are directional because they have the slits in the front and in the back. Now in the front, it's simple. There is a clear LR on the inside of the rotor height. I don't know why it was on the, not on the outside, but it is on the inside, relatively simple. But the rear rotors, this is where things got a little weird. So to distinguish between the left side and the right side, there, are, there is a groove. If you have a groove, it is one side. If you don't have a groove, it's the other side. I don't know why they couldn't just mark them, but that's what they did. And other than that, and this is where things are very, very, <laughs> gonna get very interesting. Other than the actual rotors and brakes, everything else is exactly the same out of your very nice family hatchback Corolla with CVT. The master cylinder, exactly the same. The booster, the ABS unit, everything is exactly the same. All the regular amenities and all that stuff. The only thing that is missing is brake hold. I guess you can't do brake hold in a manual transmission, can you? But the only thing that is different about the rest of the brake system or specifically the vehicle stability control or VSC. So they have something called enhanced VSC, of course, this is a car that's gonna be on a track. But more interestingly than that, there is a mode called expert mode. 
That's basically a mode that, in Toyota's own word, do not use on the roads. Use it on a track and only reserved for professional drivers. And I don't blame them because that's when it just lets you loose. You, the road, the car, and the ditch. That's basically what expert mode is. It just disengages everything. You're on your own. Go crash this car. Let's talk about the transmissions, because actually there's two versions of the transmission in this car. So the first one, which is the most popular one, is the EA67F six-speed manual transmission. Very rugged transmission. It's actually a compact unit specifically designed for this thing. Then there is the EA68F, which is actually only available in the Moriso edition. They're exactly the same. The only difference is the Moriso edition actually has different gear ratios. Very interesting. I'm going to put both comparison in case you're interested. Now, this transmission, what can be said about it? Recently, we reviewed the GR86 in my second channel. And my only complaint about it was the transmission was clunky and the clutch was just too harsh. And the car didn't even make that much power. Here is this car that makes a lot more power. And it's a lot more serious than the GR86 Subaru thing, whatever. And the clutch is super smooth. I mean, extremely smooth. You could daily drive this. And it won't tire you out. The shifts are very smooth and crisp. The transmission engages very softly. You don't need to jam it and push it and, and it's clunky and weird. No, it's very smooth. But then if you drive it hard, the shifts are very rapid. The shifts between one, two, three, four, they're, they're butter smooth. That is the only way to describe it. It is beautiful how this transmission works. And it's so fitting of this car. No matter how you drive this transmission in this clutch, you won't feel like it's not performing. It's Beautiful. And then there is something about it that is very interesting about the clutch. So the clutch in this, something I haven't really seen before. Possibly somebody has done it before, but this is definitely a first for Toyota. The clutch in this thing has something called TAC or travel adjusted clutch. What that means is, so normally in clutches, clutch is a very basic mechanical thing. You have a pressure plate that puts pressure on a little friction plate or the disc. And that gets sandwiched against the flywheel and off we go. When you let go of the pressure of the pressure plate, that disc no longer has pressure pushing on it and it backs off and now you're basically not engaged or neutral. Well, in most cars, as the disc wears down, it starts to slip because the pressure being applied to it is exactly the same. So when the disc wears down and gets thin, you start slipping. That's just how the cycle of life for clutches work. Well, that's not how things work in this car because the pressure plate in this car has an adjustability and it's automatic. And that's the best part. As the clutch disc wears down, there's actually an overcomplicated mechanical gear that increases the pressure on the clutch disc. So as the disc wears down, it's just going to keep pushing on it harder compensating for the thickness of the clutch getting smaller. That is such a great idea. And now that makes me wonder, why does every single manual transmission car have this, especially heavy duty stuff like big semis and rigs? They should all have that. That is very smart because now you're going to get every last bit of this clutch. Basically, this clutch will last until the rivets hit the flywheel. Now, that's not a good idea right there, what I just said, but that's basically what's going to happen here. Basically, you're never going to lose contact unless there's nothing to make contact anymore. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this is actually new in the service world, usually when you go buy a clutch from Toyota, you can buy the disc and the pressure plate, or they call it the, the clutch cover, separate. They're two separate pieces. You can buy whatever you want. In this, however, they come as a unit. You can only buy them as a couple together can't buy them individually. And I see why that does make sense, actually. What about maintenance for the GR Corolla, this massively exciting car? Is this going to bankrupt you in maintenance and everything else? Actually, that is not the case at all. Folks, this is all Toyota. This is not the BMW Supra with all that special oil and whatever. Let's talk a little bit about the maintenance here. Oil changes. 5,000 miles, please, or six months, the most. Oil that it takes, 
0W20 with a specific requirement, API SP slash RC or ILSAC GF6A. So you basically either use API SPRC or ILSAC GF8A. Now that sounds like a bunch of jargon. Basically, don't use oil for your tractor. Use newer oils. That's what they're trying to tell you here. And the first one I had to do an oil change here, actually I have it on video. It was a very confusing debacle, but use good oil in this engine. And actually I said 5,000 miles, six months, do it earlier if you drive it hard. Performance cars are not daily drivers, typical daily drivers where you gotta, you can extend the maintenance, whatever. Take care of this engine because it, it is a truly a masterpiece. Something else about this, this only has one cooling system that uses the typical pink coolant, super long life coolant from Toyota. Nothing special about it. Nothing special about the bleeding procedure. Actually the coolant bottle is exactly the same, that of the regular Corolla. Very interesting. Then we move to the transmission, which uses low vis viscosity GL4 fluid. Very simple, 75 weight, very available. Same thing with the differential. Very simple stuff. There's nothing really special about those two. For the engine oil, this takes four and a half quarts of 0W20, as we talked about, and it uses Toyota's N1 filter. I'll leave that part number right here. But there's something very interesting about the service procedure for this car for checking the oil level. It's because the way the internal bafflings and everything is designed in this engine. Normally, we tell you, mechanics will tell you, when you shut off your car, wait a minute, check your oil level. In this, you gotta wait at least eight minutes to check your oil level because oil actually takes a longer time to get from everywhere to the bottom so you can get an actual reading. So wait eight minutes when you check the oil level on this engine. That is the only thing that is different than the rest. Otherwise, this is basically the exact same maintenance as your any car with hubcaps from Toyota. Exactly the same. That's the best thing about it. Let me share with you some of our impressions of this car, kind of the outside and inside. It's not really a car for a proper review and how many cup holders it has and whatever. Let's start with the outside. I mean, one thing have to be said, this generation Corolla, even the regular hatchback, does look pretty cool. It does look pretty good in my opinion. I think I did really a good job. But this is truly special. Even non-car people, when they see this, this just looks special, extremely special. Let's start from the front bumper. I mean, this is a massive grill, but it is functional. It is not fake. And you see the GR4 right sticking out. It's very easy to see it. It's super cool. I, I think, I wish this was not an option. This was every single one of them because you cannot mistake this for anything else but a GR Corolla. Of course, we have our GR logo right here. I think it looks very nice that it's to the side, small, but very important. Now this car has fog lights, which is interesting to see. Very large grill, that uh, is just the way they did it for cooling, of course. Toyota Center badge in the middle, does have the radar sensor behind it. This has the latest sa Toyota safety sense, radar sensor right here. And then this is interesting. There's two little cutouts here and the rest is closed. It just gives it like a unique look, not like the regular one. This is actually, of course, open for extra cooling. And then the biggest thing is the hood is completely different. It's like raised up more and then the hood scoops. Folks, for the first time, Toyota puts real hood scoops. Let me pop the hood and you guys will see that these are actual hood scoops, not some fake ones. Now the GR Corolla does have a, uh, a stick for the hood, no hood insulation, but these are actual hood vents. So what these do is as you drive, this opening in the front that we talked about right next to the emblem, right here, they actually push air through here into here and then it comes out. And what that is meant to do is not to push the heat from the radiator, into the engine bay, it actually pushes it outside the car. 
That is so cool to minimize the kind of the temperature under the hood. These are functional and that is pretty cool. Now, the hood doesn't have insulation. It's pretty much otherwise pretty standard. But as we wrap around, we first see the first brake vent. This is an actual functional vent. This is not a fake vent. And I love the design of the wheels and these massive rotors that just, you cannot, any, not even non car people see this. These are massive brakes for a car this small. You know this is something truly special. Then as we come here, you have more vents. This is actual, an actual vent as well for cooling. GR logo right here. Then the front fender is actually completely different than the normal one. It is more pushed up, it is wider, and that's what gives it that very special stance. As we walk our way around, the doors are standard doors. They're exactly the same as a hatchback, but the rocker panel right here is wider, and it says GR4 on it, engraved in it. That is super nice. I really like it. Even though it sticks out from the car, it never really, you never really hit it when you sit in the car. It's just a perfect design. Here is what they did in the back, which I can understand why they did this, probably cost cutting, because changing the front fender, simple, fender is a bolt-on part, but the corner panel is extremely difficult to redesign. Basically, they have to redesign the entire body to make this corner panel wider, so they didn't. And this is the cool part. They put these two plastic pieces that make this body wider. Perhaps ideas for non-GR Corolla owners to get this upgrade, get the rocker panels and the fenders. These are actually bolt-on parts, and that makes sense. Fuel door is the same, everything else is the same as a regular Corolla, just these two are added. Then we come to the back, and this is where things are extremely different. I mean, the previous Corolla looked nice, it had a lot of curves, but look at this. There is this plane, and then there's this, and then there's this, and this, and then there's this turn. Just a lot going on. You cannot mistake this for anything but a GR Corolla. And of course, the optional wing. Pretty, pretty interesting look in the back. Now the wing is, some people will say this is too much. I think it is properly fitting for a car like this. This is a car that's meant to move your emotions and this, nothing moves emotions for car people more than wings and more wings. Of course, the GR Corolla badge is proudly pronounced here, but there's something else about this that is pretty interesting. The angle of the front of the hatch door is actually bigger and you could see it like really comes out more than the regular hatch. That is Pretty interesting. Now you do have some reflectors on the side and then the three tailpipes. It's just the whole package, especially to me personally, in white, this car really stands out. It's just the accents in the back, the little fake diffuser in the back, looks, just looks the part. And looks, folks, look, this car is not just all show, no go. This car is go but the looks need to match the character of the car and it definitely does in this. I love the way this looks. It is so striking, gets so much attention. I mean, in the end, it's just a Corolla, but you know what? I've never been this excited about a Corolla in a very long time, probably since the AE86, if you wanna really tell, tell you the exact time. Now, the best thing about this car is it's a functional car. You could drive it every day. I mean, let's look at the hatch area right here. Now, this is not the biggest storage area in the planet, but it's very similar to the regular hatchback. They really didn't rob any space. Underneath here, we have the battery. Battery is right there. But there is a small little touch just to make you feel special. If you notice, this little foam piece is actually specifically designed for the GR Corolla because it has the GR logo right there engraved on it. See it right here? It says GR. And the reason for that, because the battery is here, they had to redesign this foam piece. Of course, you have the tire inflator. There is no spare tire underneath here. There is just the battery. Nothing really else. That's about it. 
we don't have a spare tire in this. And I can understand this is not the car to have a spare tire. But you have storage space, not the biggest, but you can use it every day. Of course, the backup camera is right here, just like the regular Corolla, nothing really special. Rear wiper, standard stuff. And of course, in the circuit edition, you have the carbon roof. Now, when you look at this roof, initially, it has a texture, even when you touch it, it almost feels like it's not well made. But folks, this is naked carbon. Very cool to see in a car, and especially in the GR Corolla. And I wish this was standard in all of them, but it's not, it's an option, and I suppose it does kind of make sense. But what I do like is, when you look at the shark fin, they changed the color to match. Now, one thing I wish they also did, I wish they made the piano black wing right here in this section, the same color, so it would match, because you have this matte color, and then all of a sudden it's shiny, but that's a very small thing, and if you get the one without this, it'll look perfectly fine. Take a look inside this car for a few things that are very interesting. Now, the, at first glance, this looks exactly like a normal Corolla. And it is, for the most part. Except there are a few things that are unique about the GR Corolla that is very different than the regular Corolla. The first thing is the minute you sit in these seats, these are special seats for the GR Corolla. They're bucket seats. They are a very extremely nice design. But the best thing about it, they're heavily bolstered. But when you sit here, this is a very comfortable seat. I have a bad back, I'm a mechanic. Sitting here for hours, didn't really bother my back. This is a very well-made seat. I still remember 2014 Corolla. I bought a new one. I really didn't like those bucket seats in the S model. These are a lot more comfortable. I love these seats. They're super comfortable, even for long drives. But then after that, the rest is the same, but here are the differences. The steering wheel is completely unique to this car. I mean, According to Toyota, they did not want to put the regular steering wheel. It would have been fine if they did, but they did not want to because they wanted the driver to feel special behind this wheel. And special you do feel because you have a GR logo, you have different buttons. It's just a very sophisticated steering wheel. It feels very right. It's a tri-spoke, proper three-spoke steering wheel. It looks very nice. Now, something else that they did here, of course, you notice the mechanical parking brake, but there's something about it. The handle is very big. It's wrapped in leather. It just feels right. Doesn't leave feel flimsy and about to fall off. Normal Corolla actually has electronic parking brake. The shifter, this is manual only. Now in this specific one, this is the special shifter that apparently everybody wants. It says GR on it and it has Mauricio's signature on it. Some models, and we're not, not really quite sure which one exact ones. It's not really clear from the data. Some models will have Akio Toyota signature on it. Not really sure if that was a one-off thing or a prototype, but this one has Mauricio's signature and supposedly it's a weighted handle. I guess that is pretty cool. Doesn't really do anything, but very cool it gets car guys excited something else that is unique about this is the the little thing that changes the modes so if you look in the screen right here right now it says gr4 60 40. when you change it you have 60 40 you have 30 70 and then you have track track is the 50 50 mode so this is the little knob that changes that pretty simple pretty familiar, you know, very easy to use. It's right here. And there's nothing really else here in the center stack. That's it. You got some round things to put some round objects and not even a center console. Nothing because this is a focused car. HVAC controls, exactly the same as a Corolla. The uh, infotainment system, exactly the same as a Corolla. By the way, this is the latest generation infotainment system from Toyota. Works pretty good, pretty glitchy, but Hey, it's better than the old stuff. Now, the only other thing that is different about this, other than the badging all over the place, especially on the start button, it says GR start stop, is the gauge. Now, the gauge is an all screen. It's kind of unique to the GR Corolla. It does have a pretty cool GR logo when you start it and shut it off. It does have some information, turbo boost, various temperatures and whatnot. I suppose that is pretty cool, but it's not the highest customizable one. 
If this had a mechanical gauge, nobody would have complained because this car is beautiful to drive. There is something to be said about this interior. It is very comfortable, it's very well made, and the, uh, the little stuff they did here just made it very special. But the biggest thing about this, and it's kind of a surprise, I mean, you don't expect this in a in kind of a hot version of a car. It's very quiet. I mean, I wish the regular Corolla was this quiet. This is super quiet. And the car itself is also quiet. Unless you really push it, then it gets a little louder. But if you drive, you drive this, I can see myself daily driving this. I mean, you have heated seats. You have all the amenities. Adaptive cruise control. All the good stuff. This is a very, very nice thing that they did here. They did not ruin the interior for the sake of this being a special hot car. There is only one thing that I wish, and this is where toyota starts a little bit. So you, you get this really nice red stitching on the doors, you get it on the shifter, you get it on the seats, but not on the dash. You just have black stitching here. Don't know why they did that, but they did. And that's just okay. It's not the end of the world, but I wish it was red everywhere. I mean, this is the halo car after all, but we can live with that, right? So should you buy a 2023 GR Corolla? Folks, as you've seen across this video, I love this thing. That is the only way to describe it. This is 100% Toyota's work. This is not some BMW, Subaru, whatever. This is all Toyota's work and it shows throughout it. This is completely designed by Toyota and they should be very proud of it. Best part about this car is it is civilized when you drive it normally. I mean, even inside, when you drive it normally, you know, you're not racing or driving hard, it's quieter than the normal Corolla. It's not the smoothest car in the world, of course, with the suspension that it has, but it's actually not jarring or bad. Seats are comfortable, things are normal, you even get good gas mileage. That's the best part. Engine is not loud, you won't, exhaust is not loud, you won't really attract a lot of attention. But then when you put your foot down, it will put a very large smile on your face right up to the moment when you start getting in trouble. And speaking of trouble, this car can seriously get you in trouble because the way it accelerates is very smooth and it's not really loud. All of a sudden you're breaking every single speed limit and you don't even realize it. It is super stable. I mean, for a car this small, it is super stable at very high speeds that seriously will get you in trouble. Toyota and the Gazoo Racing team truly deserves a round of applause for this one because they really outdid themselves. This is how a hot version of a car should be. Not the TRD Camry and not the F-Sport from Lexus. That's right, they can do it, so just keep doing it this way. You take the exact original car, original model, and you do it from the ground up, completely different, make it unique in every single way without losing the original focus. This is a car you can actually drive every single day. It is 100% made by Toyota, so you know reliability is still a factor. It is not horrendous on gas. It is fun to drive when you want it, but it also can be a daily driver because it's comfortable. It has five seats, four doors, and you have storage in the back. It's just a Corolla in the end. But when the time, right time comes, it'll put a giant smile on your face. Folks, they really did a good job. If there is only one complaint I have about this car is, Please make more of it and please clamp down on your dealerships so they wouldn't start marking this thing up, up to the sky, and then nobody can buy it and then we're back to square one. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider subscribing to the channel, check out some of my other videos, and until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.